Machine Learning Operations, MLOps. What is MLOps? What's the purpose of it? What's the landscape of tools and technologies? And what skills do you need to learn to become a machine learning engineer? Sounds kind of like a simple question, but really it's not. If you think about how complex it is to answer the question, what does it take to become a data scientist and what all do you need to learn? If you can believe it, machine learning engineer is actually more complicated to define when it comes to what you need to learn and all of the different areas and nuances that you need to understand to be an effective ML engineer. Why is that? Well, ML engineering, ML ops, the purpose of ML ops is to support a workflow, the data science and machine learning workflow from end to end. And most businesses don't understand even their workflow. They don't understand how they go from business case to machine learning solution running in production that meets that business need. Now, if you're supposed to support a workflow that the business doesn't truly understand, now you begin to see some of the challenges that come along with machine learning operations and machine learning engineering. These challenges extend to many of the products that have been created to solve the ML ops business problems that companies have. They were built by extraordinarily intelligent data scientists. And really the only way you're going to have a strong understanding of ML ops is the same way they figured out how they were going to be building the products that they've brought to market now. They were data scientists. They worked at various phases in the ML workflow. They found problems. They found things that they could fix and automate and make easier on themselves and then they turned all of that knowledge into the startup and the product that they use today. So they were essentially solving their own problem. Unfortunately, and you'll hear a lot of founders at MLOps companies say this, workflows are so diverse. There's no standard data science and machine learning workflow. And the specific work activities, the, the way that data scientists do different pieces of those workflows are diverse enough that there is no one size fits all solution. And so as an ML engineer, not only are you going to be selecting, in some cases, architecting, but you're also going to be building custom in-house solutions for your data scientists. And this could be at any phase in this workflow. So you have to start by understanding the end-to-end -end workflow and how each step is really accomplished. How do data scientists do their job? Without that sort of grounding in reality, whatever you end up building or buying is going to be your best guess at what data scientists need. That's what all of these platforms out there are. And that's why the landscape is so complex. That's why there's so many platforms is because each one of them is a an attempt to do as much of the workflow as possible. And you'll hear startup founders saying, look, it's just not possible to be the everything to everyone ML ops platform, but we're trying to hit all of the really high returning activities. And most platforms do a pretty decent job of it. Others are very niche. Like they do support a large variety of activity styles and data science styles, but they do it at a very focused place. They do it in a very, very niche way. And that's sort of the way that the landscape has tackled a lot of this complexity and diversity in ML ops procedures and support requirements. Unfortunately, most of the products that are on the market today were really built and architected about two, three years ago. And the modern machine learning workflow today versus the one that a lot of these platforms were built to support are different. So there's a lot of customization that's being driven one di by diversity, but also number two, Workflows are maturing. We are focusing more on the experiment and supporting experiments that are not only statistical and model-based experiments, but also more scientific experiments. And so the experimental management side, the artifact management side, a lot of these haven't matured very quickly. And so you'll be building custom solutions to a number of these emerging data science workflow problems. What does that mean as far as capabilities? We'll take your data science skill set. Now you got to add a few things onto it. Programming languages like Java, because you're going to be interfacing with enterprise applications. And so you need to have a programming language like Java under your belt. And if you end up working on hardware optimization, which is another key area of ML engineering, you've got C, C++. And you'll be working with a variety of different technologies and different tech stacks. 
that require you to have a lot more of that software engineering and software architecture, the patterns, the practices, and so on background than your traditional data scientist does. However, you don't need all of the math stats and everything else that a more rigorous researcher or research focused data scientist would need because you need to understand their workflow and their process and how they accomplish all those different pieces of the workflow, but you don't necessarily need to know in depth how all of these models work and how all the nuance of the architecture works. So you're moving a little bit away from the math and the science side, and you're moving more towards the process workflow and software engineering and architecture side. Now, most of my videos I can do from memory. I can just rattle off what it is that you need to learn. And it's easy for me because I've been doing it forever. This landscape is so complicated. I have notes. So forgive me for reading a little bit off of notes, but there are so many pieces to cover and I don't want to inadvertently skip one. So let me start with what are the key areas of the workflow and work activities that you're going to be supporting? If you talk to data scientists and say, hey, what would you like your MLOps platform to do? And there's been tons of surveys that have done this. They'll really focus in on four areas. They'll talk about data wrangling. They'll talk about data quality, data quality management, model development, and they'll talk a little bit about serving and implementation and that sort of thing. Doesn't sound that hard, does it? Now, what does that actually mean when it comes to the workflow? What are all of the areas you have to support to really meet those four business needs? So we start with data collection. Start at the very beginning with that pipeline. You need to be able to go out, gather data in an automatic reproducible way that's low effort on the data scientist's part and results in higher quality data sets. And you're going to need to support their work exploring the data and understanding different components of the data, maybe even going back and changing the way that the data is collected in simple, straightforward, mostly automated ways. You've got data management, it's gotta go sit someplace, it's gotta live in a database or a data lake or any number of different repositories. So it has to have an architecture of its own and it needs to be versioned. So there is a version control for data sets and there's a lot of metadata that's actually captured in order for a data scientist to understand the provenance behind any given data set so they understand what it can be used for. Data processing, so that's your wrangling, and then your validation. Make sure it is actually in the format that someone expects it to be in and that a model can consume it and start training or any number of different potential use cases from. So that's your validation. Now you got feature stores, which are relatively new. Again, back to the metadata that you have to gather around data. Anytime you build a feature, it's the same deal. You've done some feature engineering and you need to capture the metadata around how you did that. How'd you create the feature and how is the data behind the feature gathered? That all is saved into a feature store. And then the feature store can serve that data to any number of use cases from analytics to machine learning models. And so the feature store is sort of showing up to handle that particular niche of use cases. It's not very mature at this point. There are a lot of pitfalls to feature stores, but it's something that's getting better as they go. Model development environments, just like a software development environment, but you know you have to do a lot of the same sort of software development that a traditional software engineer would, and so you need similar environments. And you need source control, you know, your good old Git or any other source repository. Your data has source control and versioning. Your code needs to have source control and versioning. Hyperparameter tuning is something that ML ops platforms are now automating. Data scientists are pretty interested in this because it saves a lot of time for them. And in a lot of cases, the hyperparameter tuning that's done automatically is actually smarter than what, what we end up doing. So it's in demand and there are some applications out there that handle that. Model and data metadata management. So you have a model that you've trained with a data set and this whole package that you use to create an end result model needs to be saved, versionized, and all the metadata that would allow somebody to come back, go to the same starting point that you did, 
and get the same result back to validation and reproducibility. So you need information that would allow them to do that or allow an automated system to repl replicate the experiment. You've got resource management or distributed resource managers, um, you know, things like AWS. So all of the environments that have to be spun up for everything from development to training, testing, validation, and potentially running it alongside something in production, those environments all need to be managed automatically and be able to be spun up and pulled down without a whole lot of overhead by the data scientist. Your experimental tracking, which I talked about a little bit earlier, and your orchestration, more importantly, automatically being able to kick off workflows and experiments and have them run with a whole, without a whole lot of intervention. So essentially the data scientist just comes back and gets the results and reviews what happened as a result of the experiment. You've got your artifact management. Experiments can produce novel models, novel data sets, or garbage in some cases. But in any case, those artifacts need to be saved and tracked, almost like another type of source control. You have your quality assurance side, your model testing, which leads to debugging. And also beyond that, explainability or interpretability. You need to have a platform that supports all three of those functions. Release management, release is a gated process, and so you need something that does manage that process. Your model serving and deployment, obviously this is something that's pretty traditional when it comes to MLOps. Optimization, uh, optimizing your model so from a hardware perspective, so they run more efficiently and they cost less to run in production and serve inference in production. Also, you can optimize for training, and this is typically where people are focused on is optimizing for training and uh, making the model take less time or utilize lower footprint of hardware so it's cheaper to train. Um, you have to monitor and continuously retrain in production. And then you have security and robustness. So security is everything from just traditional hacking to adversarial threats and attacks. And then there's robustness, making sure that it's actually going to work and function in production and it's available. And all of those other just core support, operational support type of platforms are just as necessary for machine learning models that run in production. So across the board, everyone wants more automation than they have, but it's expensive. And you, in many cases, are going to be, like I said, making buy, build decisions. And there's only, obviously, so much budget. You're going to have to stretch that. And so you can hear, in a lot of ways, you're not only an architect, you're almost a negotiator. You're looking at getting the best bang for your buck. And so you're evaluating a whole lot of buy, build type decisions. So you're not just an engineer. There's more to this role when it comes to building out a stack and building out an architecture to support all of the different tasks and all of the different steps in the workflow. Now, let me get into the actual sort of landscape of what types of tools are out there and what areas of the workflow that they target. So you have something called AutoML, which is for your citizen data scientists. These are people in the organization who are not technically data scientists. They're users. They are stakeholders in other parts of the business. And increasingly, there are these automated machine learning solutions that allow them to just take a data set and deploy model with very little data science and machine learning expertise. I think it's dangerous, but there are use cases where it's actually pretty effective. And there are a number of companies that are getting a lot of value out of it. So companies in that space are H2O, Data Robot. They both offer this end-to-end -end auto ML platform that citizen data scientists can use with very, very little knowledge to sometimes dangerously deploy models and solve their own business problems. Feature stores, we talked about that a little bit earlier. Feast is a good example of a feature store. You have things that handle hyperparameter tuning like Talos, um, stream processing, data stream versus batch processing. You've got Kafka, and then just your traditional data processing, things like Airflow and Spark sometimes feed into Kafka as well. Your data operations, just managing data, getting it from place to place, ingesting it, cleaning it, so on. You got things like Snorkel. Um, for annotation, there are actually data annotation frameworks and automated data annotation frameworks, which again, I think it's a little dangerous, but 
everybody's got a different opinion of what ops should be. Intel and Microsoft both have solutions for that, as well as a, a couple of other vendors that are out there that do automated data annotation. You have explainability frameworks and Google and Microsoft, in my opinion, have the best explainability frameworks, but there are a number of other ones that have come out and that are improving rapidly. So you'll probably have some sort of automated explainability framework. Um, your distributed management Kubernetes, in my opinion, is king, but again, there are many other options out there. As far as platform, like an end-to-end -end platform, like I talked about at the very beginning, there are things like Kubeflow or MLflow. Data Robot has an end-to-end -end ML platform solution. But again, you talk to anybody and they'll tell you that no matter how end-to-end -end it is, it is always one feature away from being the perfect fit. And you're going to have to build some sort of custom solution in-house to manage just the complexity of all of the little nuances of how data science organizations actually do the key activities in the workflow. You've got your model management, which is experimental management, as well as model management and artifacts, the Comet, Neptune AI. You've got model serving, you may be familiar with like TensorFlow serving or Torch serve. Those are typical. Uh, you've got hardware optimization like Dask and Rapids. Uh, there's some other ones out there. Um, and then you've got kind of the old standbys. You know, the things like your databases and your BI and your data lakes and legacy systems like Oracle and SAP and so on. I'm not saying all Oracle is legacy or all SAP is legacy. I'm just saying a lot of companies have legacy systems from companies like that. You can see legacy Microsoft systems are out there everywhere. And so you will be integrating with a number of different parts of the business. You'll have marketing ops that you'll probably be integrating with an entire suite of marketing systems and just on and on. Supply chain typically has legacy systems that you're dealing with. In many cases, you are serving to them, but you're also pulling data from them, especially if you're working on process automation or something in that direction. You're pulling data off, you know, using some, some real ugly workarounds to get data out of legacy systems that were never meant to play well with others. And that's, Part of your job is understanding how to do that. And then finally, not really new or emerging, but your microsystems, things uh, like Kubernetes, again, uh, microsystems architecture is something that you should probably be familiar with and understand the microsystems landscape and how to break an application up into microsystems because you'll be consuming from microsystems and interfacing and integrating with microsystems when you deploy to production. So it's a good thing to know. So that, oh, that's it. That's all. It's incredibly deep. It's incredibly complicated. No one knows everything. Think about the size of the company that you want to work with. The bigger the company, meaning the larger and more complex their workflow and the more of these tools that they're going to have, the bigger the team that you'll end up working on and the more people who will be able to augment your knowledge. But the key is really understand that workflow. Understand how data scientists do what they do and then keep up with that long list of specific areas and categories within the workflow and keep adding to your knowledge. Like they are continually adding new categories to this list. Keep up with them and just keep an eye on new companies and new releases. Sometimes that's all it takes is just reading the release notes and some of the new features that come out every time one of the vendors releases a new version that can help you keep up to date with the ML ops landscape. But again, don't feel like you have to understand everything building. You need the software engineering. So that piece of it, you definitely need a strong capability with, you need to be someone who can do software engineering and who can not only code in Python, but probably Java and C or C plus plus as well. So that part, sorry, no shortcuts. But as far as the landscape's concerned, like I said, understanding the categories and the workflow is really the important piece and being able to assess tools and understand how that tool works compared with how the data scientists that you're supporting at that point in the process work. So that's the landscape. That is end to end what you need to know in order to become an ML engineer. <laughs>